back at it again. Here I'm re-gluing the soundboard to the neck block that came loose while we were disassembling things last time. Just looking at the bushings on the 46 SJ here, the ones that came with the, the replacements, they're these um, hexagonal style, which I don't think are a good match, because in 1951 they were definitely round bushings and fairly bright nickel. I think um, rather than change these out, these ones would be more appropriate on, say, a 1940 Martin rather than a 1950 Gibson. So I think I'm just going to keep these because they look more the part. I'm going to do some work on the 1946 J45 here. This one needs the new bridge, the neck reset. There are several very obvious cracks on the back, some brace ends which are loose. The repair history on this one is maybe less obvious than on the SJ. Has it had the neck reset? Eh, I don't know. I always like to start by examining the area around the 14th fret, uh, or the 12th fret, depending on the model, but the one that's directly over the body joint. Because sometimes you can see uh, evidence that the slot has been sawn through so the fingerboard extension can come off. Is that a hairline I see there? Or is it just regular lacquer checking? There's a whole lot of schmutz in there. Um, which could be filler after the fact or it could be just stuff that has blown in on the wind. Uh, there's also this rather large patch of finish damage here, which could happen if, say, someone was um, steaming it off and... I don't know. It's just a funny place for that much wear. Unless someone was constantly playing Sweet Child of Mine. So what do I do if I heat up the extension and it comes apart from the rest of the board? Well, at that point, I would pull out the 12th fret get out my fret saw, saw through it, remove it as well, then glue those two parts together, uh, flip them over, and route a slot for reinforcement on the underside. And I'd have to make a little filler piece for the saw kerf, and glue it back onto the neck proper. The problem with having the joint right above the body is you're usually relying on that tiny little bit of end grain to stand up against all the folding forces of string tension on it and they usually end up bending right there and uh, you do not get like long-term good results. We're going to take this bridge off and I will make a more historically accurate version. Uh, it shouldn't have the adjustable saddle and it shouldn't have a belly on either side. In 1946 this should just be a straight bridge. Let's look at the strange texture left behind by someone's touch-up efforts because there is legit washboarding of the spruce under here that looks like it's real pickware. Like someone loves strumming up at the top end of the board here. Uh, a lot. And then someone else decided to put something brown over top. Um, perhaps this was strummed through again, maybe it flaked off, I don't know what this material is. Eventually I'm gonna, you know, do a little bit of airbrush over all of this, but I just thought it was interesting the history here is, it's pretty impressive. And down here, a darkness has fallen over the sun-warmed terrain that looks really at odds. Am I right? Like, that, that's, that's not right, visually. Um, there's a chance that deeply was it stained, per nostra crimina. That would be a real shame, because I'm, you know, I want to scrape this back or sand it so that it's, down to bare spruce like the surroundings. Honest pickware would look more appropriate than that. Um, it'll be easier to try that with the bridge out of the way. So the order of operations, I'm going to take the bridge off and I'm going to glue up all the back cracks and then I'm going to try to take off the neck. Starting off with this guitar, the action is 9 ths both bass and treble, and the neck is very straight. It's uh, well, there's virtually no relief in it. It's like one or two thousandths. The stringing about to commence. This guitar is already missing one of its tuner bushings. So we get the strings off on these old guys. We have to make sure to put an elastic band around the tuners 
or take an old string and bend it into a U so that those things don't go all wandering. People ask, what are those bushings actually for? Well, in use, the string tension will pull the tuner post forward, and if there's nothing there that's metal, it's just going to bear against the top surface of the um, headstock, and over time that can make a oval sort of hole, and this will bend farther and farther to the point where the gears will not mesh correctly with um, the tuner shaft. So you can, I mean, there are guitars that were made without these for the sake of cost, but you know, you should find something to put in there. The first three frets might do with a replacement as well, because we're getting right down there. It's like someone loved that E chord. As Mr. Cohen said, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. A quick look inside. Things seem pretty good except for the total absence of two braces. Both tone bars are gone. There are some remnants of wood fiber in the central area of where they were, which might suggest that they'd come partially free and someone pried them the rest of the way off, which is something that no repair person who's ever experienced trying to put one of these braces back would ever do, because they are a royal pain. Here we go, pulling another bridge off. You getting tired of seeing me do this yet? This one actually has some nice uh, open spots down low. So hopefully it won't take too much time or effort. There's a bunch of glue squeeze out still on the top, on the front side of the bridge. The dark touch-up seems to be some kind of paint. I'm lucky in that it didn't sink deeply into the wood, so I can spend some time picking it off. There were numerous back cracks, both long and short, so I got glue in them, pumped it through with the suction cup, and then clamped using various methods. I used the magnets to keep the two sides level with each other while I apply the clamps. Let's talk about Gibson pick guards of the 1940s and 50s. They're almost invariably a tortoise pattern celluloid. Previously they used other materials and uh, other shapes too, but this is the standard shape they settled on. Uh, they have an interesting shape, actually, because they've got this weird little dipsy doodle on the back end of the bridge. It's not straight back here, and it's not like a smooth curve. There's an indent, for some reason. It's not the same shape as a Martin pick guard at all, and most aftermarket guards you buy will probably be a Martin pattern. So that would be, it would look strange to the practiced eye if you put a Martin, um, say an OM style guard on one of these. Now I've made a couple before, and right now I'm thanking myself, thank you previous Ted, for making a router pattern. That's a tip for novice repair people. If an old guitar shows up with an original guard on it, take a minute and trace it. Um, I should probably show that. Get yourself some inexpensive thin copy paper. Um, it can help if you can tape it down, but on a surface like this I wouldn't use tape. And this isn't the proper pencil. I'd want something softer, like a 2B, 3B. Um, but the way I do it is just go around the outline shading up to it. So if you come onto it, you butt into it. Anyway, you get the picture. You can see the outline here, and you can make a firmer line, cut that out, and uh, perhaps either trace it or glue this to a piece of wood, or in my case, quarter-inch hardboard, and uh, make yourself a pattern. Because you never know when this information could come in handy, right? You could be required to uh, reproduce a guard for a guitar that you don't have another model on hand for, um, at which point you're trying to extrapolate from things you see online, etc. This is much easier. You just pull out the tracing you made from your um, binder or your file folder and then uh, get to work. So this one here is actually from a 1950 J50 guitar, which is the sister guitar to the 45. They made you pay extra for a natural finish because they had to use better wood. Now the other thing to know is the effects of time. 70, 80 years, they can warp and shrink the old pick guards in different ways. And I've seen some originals that are quite misshapen, 
uh, or that perhaps don't particularly match well with the um, the purfling line around the sound hole, that kind of thing. That's just kind of part of the charm of these old guitars. But this one matches up very well to this J45. Ooh, I've actually got another early 50s Gibson to compare it to. Give me a sec. I've got an LG1 from 1954. This is a real basket case uh, which I purchased for myself. We'll eventually get into this one. This is going to need everything, basically. Um, it's just got the ghost of the previous guard there. And lining this up. Yeah, so it'll work for LG ones too. Nice. I got these blanks from Solo Guitars, which is a Canadian company in the bustling suburb of Concord, Ontario. Good people. Sell a whole bunch of kit parts and uh, other stuff for building. Uh, I like it because it's just a tiny bit thicker than some of the other tortoise stuff on the market. Especially the um, the Asian stuff. The imports uh, really hit and miss in terms of both color and thickness. Because the guards in the 1930s and 40s and into the 50s were considerably thicker than what either Martin or Gibson is using today. You know, This is more similar to that. It's not quite as thick, but it is thicker. I think that's the corner I want to use. This still has the protective plastic on the top. I'm going to leave it on there while I shape it. I'll cover both this and the template with uh, masking tape and super glue them together. Orienting the fire stripe material can be a bit of a puzzle sometimes, depending on how the flame is aligned. Uh, sometimes making maximum use of the material won't give you the best visual effect. Like if it was running horizontally with the guard, no, not right. Usually, if you look at these guitars, the flame is going, it's slanting upwards towards the center line of the guitar uh, and the fingerboard. So actually in this case, yeah, that's all right. I don't mind that. Just getting rid of the excess here. I mean, you can try and cut this stuff with scissors. Oh, it's just on the edge of what's possible though. And getting a really clean outline, uh, not so easy. Using a knife, same deal. I always like to caution people that you should have a little bit of experience with a router before you start doing this kind of template work. Because if you don't know what you're doing, sometimes the bit can grab the piece and actually pull it out of your hands. Looking at these now, with the white backing still in place, uh, the guards obviously look too light because it comes shining through. But I'm noticing even when I peel it back and hold it up to the dark portion of the soundboard, I'm not convinced. Still probably a little bit too light for my tastes. And this is the thing with trying to replicate old guards. You know, the materials they used back then just aren't manufactured to the same specifications. You know, that's a little better. Uh, still, yeah, not quite. It's not quite there. So I'm going to do something that I read about like 20 years ago. Robert Painter um, wrote an article about making celluloid pick guards for Huss and Dalton. Uh, they weren't entirely satisfied with the color they were getting. And so they shot some brown paint on the back side of the guards to darken them down a little bit. And um, in my case, of course, we've got that pressure sensitive adhesive already applied, which I'm not really a fan of. Um, I'm going to hit it with some brown lacquer, which should meld nicely with this, uh, rather than relying on the tape. Which, to be honest, I've had some really mixed results with on old undulating surfaces like this. Um, like it doesn't really want to make perfect contact and you end up with sort of air bubbles and stuff going on underneath. The tape works well on brand new smooth finishes, but I just don't seem to get good enough contact. Uh, especially if there's finish missing, you know.
So I'm going to use glue to hold these down anyway. So I did an experiment with an off cut here. Put a light coat on and it's visibly darker. Uh, less garish. And I think that's a much better match for what I saw in the original ones. So we're going to go with this. I'm going to be using some Oxford Tobacco Brown. This is a tinted lacquer. Canadian company, which is great because uh, I don't have to worry about the ridiculous expense of trying to ship nitrocellulose lacquer over the border. And uh, they come in a whole range of colors. Again, not a sponsor, but they're good people. It's a good product. And uh, I've been using it a lot for various touch-ups and stuff. So I've got this raised on a block, so it's not going to be sitting in a pool of uh, lacquer, and hopefully it doesn't get under the uh, edge onto the front surface. If it does, I can sort of polish it off. But uh, I'm going to be spraying this from a fair height, probably 16 inches, 18 inches, so that may be 400 millimeters, and light coats. Like, I'm not going to be going back and forth. I want it sort of a mist. Leave it like that. If I want a bit more, I'll put a bit more on in, you know, 10 minutes or so. Yep. Much happier with that. And that's what I want to see. You know, the fire stripe is visible, but it's not in your face. It's the same for this one here. You know, it's just a little too light. I'll spray this one too. I'm going to start working on a bridge here for the J45. Gibson bridges of this period tend to be a little thinner than the equivalent Martins. Eh, maybe around 5 sixteenths at their highest. They're flat on top and they tend to slope pretty dramatically towards the treble side. I've marked out the taper and I'm planing it in. I need to plot where this bridge should be. This is an original size bridge, which uh, it's actually about a 64th of an inch wider. I think I can see and feel a line here which probably corresponded with the original one. It's kind of unfortunate because we're going to see bare wood on both sides. I'll do my best to touch it up some after we're done. Um, this is important because I need to know where to drill the holes and have them line up properly. I just want to make sure that there is enough room at the front edge of the bridge for the saddle to be in an appropriate place. I've marked a light pencil line on the top there to denote the front edge of the bridge. Now these holes are slightly eccentric of course, but I should be able to get um, a general center line uh, by measuring to the front of each hole and the back. And uh, I've got about 15 millimeters to the front edge of the hole, 20 millimeters to the back. And that seems pretty consistent. So, splitting the difference, the holes, the center of the holes, have to be drilled 17.5 millimeters from the front edge of the bridge. And in this case, the holes for the screw uh, seem to be the same. Well, they might be a little bit farther forward. These holes change slightly, depending on who was drilling them, I guess. I'm drilling the holes about 80% of the way through because I know that there's going to be a lot of shaping to do on the underside of the bridge while fitting it to the guitar, and the holes just get in the way. This marks their location. Okay, before I sand the scoop into the wings, I need to round over the edges a bit. Um, proportionally more on the back side. This little radius or bull nose has to resolve somewhere around the back edge of the uh, bridge pin holes. And I do it now because when I sand into it, um, it's going to create this swoopy effect that is really hard to duplicate after the fact. So 
I also have to reckon on the fact that the bridge pin holes are going to get larger when I've reamed them for the pins. Uh, they're currently 3 16ths of an inch. The pearl dot holes on either side, which will disguise the screws, uh, are a quarter of an inch. The ends of the straight, unbellied bridges are treated differently from the ones they made in the 1930s. The earlier ones had a curve down towards the end, sort of a, well again, it's sort of a bullnose shape. Uh, but in the 40s, they're left square. I'm just marking the ends of the scoop, which happen just outside the boundaries of the, um, the pearl dot hole. Maybe a millimeter or so. I'm using tape because it's easier to see in the dark confines of my shed when I'm using my sander. Before making something like this, it's a good idea to check out all the available reference. I remember that Carrie Char had published a plan through the Guild of American Luthiers, uh, so I looked up the issue here, and his is a 1947 version. The wear patterns on this guitar are very similar to the one I'm working on. And, uh, you know, decent photos, and then of course I went back and looked at the Folkway website to check out some more. Um, in reference to the SJ bridge I pulled off the stripped guitar in episode 1, I believe I got it wrong when saying that those should also be straight bridges. No, no, they have a standard belly bridge on them, a Martin style bridge. When I'm talking off the top of my head sometimes, I'll get it twisted, occasionally. Because there's a whole lot of trivia rattling around in there. So before I make something, I like to always go back and double check, right? It's amazing the number of these guitars that have non-original bridges on them. And things like the year they were manufactured matters, too. Why, yes, I am very careful of my fingertip in this position. And no, it would not get sucked in and mangled. Uh, the drum is revolving in the opposite direction, so it be pushed out rather than pulled in. When sanding these bridges, sometimes it's good to remember that Gibson really didn't belabor the labor. Um, you can see sanding scratches in a lot of them. So I need to make some replacement tone bars. What happened? How did they fall out? Where did they go? I suspect they were probably working as double agents in early Cold War USA. Their assumed names would have been Roman and Marguerite. When government inquiries got too close, they took their valuable secrets and defected, probably spent the 1960s wearing fancy sunglasses at some holiday destination along the Gulf of Riga. Gibson soundboards are arched, and it's a pretty tight radius too, somewhere around 15, 16 feet, which is miles away from Martin's. Um, I think Martin eventually went to something like a 40 foot radius, if memory serves. But originally their braces were glued down on a flat platen, so they started off basically flat. Um, they naturally take a bit of a rise or belly over time. Gibsons were built differently. So I have to shape the gluing surfaces on the braces to match. Like if I was to make them flat and then sort of crank down the clamps, we'd end up with some really nasty looking distortions, and they'd probably not want to stay attached in the long run. This is a template I made long ago for marking braces. Um, it's a 16 foot radius on one side, which I actually use for my backs, and 28 on the other, which is what I use for my steel string tops. Now, there's something to ponder while we're discussing braces. Um, we talk about the benefits of various radii, but in the real world, things don't normally bend in a true radius. So you grab a piece of steel or a piece of wood, you hold it at the ends and you bend it into a curve, you'll notice that uh, it's pretty rounded in the center, but if you look at the ends, it flattens out dramatically. Um, it's called a catenary curve. Chains or ropes that are hanging between posts will describe the same shape. So when I'm making braces for a guitar I'm building, uh, that's the shape I make them. It's not a continuous radius. It, sort of flattens out towards the end. I figure that's the way the soundboard actually wants to bend. So, you know, it's going to be under less stress in the long run, which is, you know, just something to consider. 
big heavy cut squaring one side of some very old, very dry spruce. You want good seasoned stock when making braces, at least I do. I'll use my template just to draw the curve. I like a planed surface rather than sanding them. I think it's cleaner and it might make for a better glue joint. And in cross section there's quite a lot of work to make these kind of triangular in shape. In the late 50s they started making them more square with rounded tops. The earlier ones were lighter and this gets rid of some of the excess mass. That's the cross section there. And then on to scalloping. Here's my second retraction of the week. In episode one I said that J45s didn't have scalloped bracing. They actually did up until 1955. Some of the smaller body guitars at that time didn't. I got confused. To position things for what's an arduous glue up, I use magnets to act as a guide. There's a pair of them all ready to go. Like I said, this is amongst the most annoying glue ups in existence because the clamps never seem to be the right length. So I usually end up doing it in two stages and manufacturing something to get it done. So I get one half clamped and then move over and do the other half. And as that's drying, I think that's enough for this time. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you again soon.